Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of June 14, 2017. As we start all meetings, I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and is also being broadcast live, so keep that in mind. I'd ask you to please join me in a moment of silence and in this moment of silence, please keep in your thoughts Gail Fontaine, who was a para here at Whitman Hanson at the high school that passed away recently. Thank you. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of May 22nd, 2017. So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Before um, Mara Burt gives us her student advisory, I'd like to remind everyone this is the last meeting for Ellen Stockdale and John Quayley. I'd like to thank them both for the years of service to Whitman Hanson Regional School District. They've, they've both done well in this district and were, were very, uh, very well respected. So I'd like to thank them and give them a hand. For the years of service. Okay, student advisor, Mara Burt. So on Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017, in the high school cafe, the 18th annual Family Science Fun Night was held. The high school advanced placement science students hosted an evening of science experimentation. Teams of AP science students had researched and prepared hands-on science activities geared to, geared to grade K through five students. We will miss dearly the class of 2017 as they leave us and head off into the world. All senior events, including the final exams, prom, senior banquet, scholarship night, senior cookout, and graduation flew by with laughs and tears. The Qantas MVP night was also held to appreciate the outstanding student and athlete leaders within the school. While it was humbling to recognize these amazing young men and women, it was even more humbling to think of the others who lead by the little things they do every day. In Women Middle School, the end of the year activities are underway in 186 eighth grade students and staff just returned from the annual trip to New York and Philly this past Friday. A true highlight was being able to view one of the 15 handwritten bills of rights that are on loan at the National Constitution Center. Also, the boat rides to both Ellis and Liberty Island are always treats as well as the Broadway show School of Rock. This week, there will be both morning and award, both morning award ceremonies by grade as well as field days. Anyone have any questions? For Ms. Burt, great job, thank you. Thank you. Okay, for the sake of getting some people in and out, I'm gonna take a few things out of order. Tonight we have with us Dr. David Belcher. He's from Quincy Pediatrics. He is going to be a new school physician. We have to vote on this, so I'd like to present a warm welcome to Dr. Belcher. I would entertain a motion to appoint Dr. Belcher as a school physician. So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Welcome aboard. And if anybody has any questions, um, I, I see my role as being somewhat flexible you know, as needs of the school come up to you know, figure out what I do and the extent of what I do in my interaction. I look forward to working with the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Belcher will be meeting next Tuesday morning with our school nurses so that they can get to know him and ask him any questions. Uh, eight eight o'clock, and it'll be in this building on the second floor. So we'll. They're. I met with them yesterday. Uh, John Queely and I did, and they're looking forward to meeting you. Thank you very much. Great, right. and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Also, we need. We had uh, the turf field contracts have come in, and Ernie Sandlin is here. We have to vote to appoint, um, to 
give the contract to a certain vendor, Ernie, would you like to come up? Uh, in your packet, there's a letter from uh, Birchwood. Design group. This is from the facilities. It's got a little birch tree on the front. Right. I got, I got him. I have a duplicate, so here's yeah, another one. Sure. You no, you can leave it because I don't think I have one. Um, I don't think I do, but I'm trying to open my packet right now. You may have one. I might have it in my, on my screen here. It is. I think it was it flat in your docket, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Her eating glass? Oh, here it is. Check. She should have had it. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. everyone had it. Okay. It was a handout tonight. Everybody right? got one? It's not really in the packet. Mm -hmm. You won't find it in the packet. Okay. Thank you. So there's an extra one right here. Yeah. Oh, you got one. Yeah, it's got it. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Erin. Christine. So on May 30th um, at 1 o'clock, uh, we opened up the bids upstairs in the central office. It was an open open meeting, open bid. Uh, we had five actual vendors that responded. Out of the five, only three were actually <coughs> compliant with the bid specifications. Um, and so they all gave us samples of the turf, and then we um, had Birchwood review and evaluate all of the bids that came in, the turf, and also to make sure that they were um, compliant with the actual bid specifications. Okay, so the process that we went through putting this uh, out to bid is we looked at a bunch of fields that are out there and we came up with what we thought was probably myself, Bob Rogers, uh, Matt Carew, um, and the, uh, Jeff Simonak was involved with it. And we found that, that there was a certain type of field we wanted to replace this field with. And we put the specifications together uh, in that process, we learned quite a bit, but we learned that um, through this whole process, there's a lot of different vendors out there that want to sell you a whole bunch of different turf fields. Uh, so that's why we came up with the idea that once we put the specification together, we'd have an engineer look at it, which he did. Uh, he did make some, tw he tweaked our specification a little bit, and then we had three main turf field manufacturers that we put in the specification. So when you look at the document uh, from Birch, um, Birchwood uh, Design Group, Northeast Turf appears to be the, looks to be the lowest bidder, but they don't qualify in the specification. Uh, the next company, which is um, uh, Turf Field USA, is actually the field that we have out on um, the existing turf field now. And what we did, um, once we got into this whole process, we called AI3, who's doing a lot of fields, doing a lot of buildings in Massachusetts, and we asked them who they use for the engineer um, when they design, um, and they came up with Birchwood. We contacted them, and it's been actually very good. Christine and I have been on the phone with this gentleman, emails, and um, I think it's a, it's a very good specification, and the final product would be excellent. Uh, we did uh, request $425,000 from both towns. We did get the 425. dollars If you'll notice on the second line, field turfs bid is $362,453. There are some alternates that we did put in the specification that we did not accept at this time because our fear down the road, once this project starts, we want to make sure when we pull back that carpet, whatever's under there is proper and we'll be able to use it for drainage. Until that time comes, um, then we'll look at the alternates in the future once we know everything is gonna go the right way. So, it's been an interesting voyage, uh, but we, uh, the final product, and that's what I look at, the final product will be something we'll be all proud of. And it'll still continue to get a lot of use. Anyone? Fred? 
just to uh, add that we did go over this a little bit more extensively in our facility subcommittee meeting and uh, we were looking at the warrant fact that it comes with an eight-year warranty uh, with a 10-year life expectancy uh, which is pretty much what we had originally uh, they have improved the field so perhaps uh, with proper maintenance we could get a little bit uh, more time out of it and we did uh, unanimous, unanimously uh, recommend uh, to approve Field Turf USA as the uh, awarded contract. Questions? I'd entertain a motion to accept Field Turf USA at $362,453. So moved. Second. Discussion? Yeah. How does this compare to the allocation that we got? Did, this was a capital we submission got 425. to the town. We got 425, so we're about 100. 20 under no, no. 60. 60. Yeah. That's, 60 that's the math there's but that under. Kevin what's going to happen uh, we do have some alternates that will will accept after we know everything scope aesthetic what what's going on underneath that field once we start to pull that field back the old field mm -hmm. drainage making sure the drainage pop is is proper okay and then some of the alternates that we would like to do would be a logo of the the logo in the center shading of the numbers and also um, a, um, a maintenance contract um, down the road um, what we've asked for in one of the alternates is how much would it cost us to maintain the field for eight the eight years of the warranty mm -hmm. so we have all those numbers and even if we accept all those we'll still be under the 425 but we're really cautious because we want to just make sure when they pull that carpet back everything's good okay. all right thank you any Anyone else? I can Fred? perhaps elaborate because we did take some notes. Uh, the three alternates uh, fall uh, went through would total 44,375. So even if we did need to do some drainage work, we could hopefully still be uh, within what we had uh, anticipated. Anyone else? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Great. Thanks, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Christine. I know these bids are a workout work. at times. Okay, superintendent's report. Okay. We'll get back on track. Thank you. We have a number of things um, to wrap up here at the end of the school year. Um, the other day, we were reflecting on the variety of things that happened during the school year. Um, they can be as recent as a smell in the elevator at the Hanson Middle School or as dramatic as the gas problem that we had at Whitman Middle School. Um, back in the fall, we had the handsome police after some folks, and that required some management on our part. So it's been a very busy year. Some of you may remember back to the clown sightings. So as we were reflecting on that, folks were saying, and that all happened this year, and it did. Um, for the past two years, since Dr. Dillon has been with us, he has been working on a comprehensive emergency management plan. When we reflected on the events from this year, we became ever more certain as to why those things needed to happen. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have to evacuate the Whitman Middle School, but it was getting close, and our first responders and the gas company got in there and took care of it. But things do happen. Um, so I've asked uh, Pat to report for us this evening on the progress that he and his task force have made in the past two years and what's going to happen next. Yep, so thanks. Uh, so we, we currently have 13 people uh, on the District Safety and Security Committee who have reviewed the plan and provided individual feedback. So we're incorporating that feedback <coughs> with the expectation that uh, the version one of the SEMP will be uh, to the superintendent by the end of the month. Um, we'll then subsequently take parts of the summer to just run that by the chiefs and first responders to get their feedback. Um, one of the outcomes of that will be uh, in August, we'll present a 2017-2018 training plan that kind of lays out what we'd like to accomplish in terms of training the staff and the students. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback from stakeholders, especially the first responders that um, you know, they're basically asking us to elevate uh, our, our readiness for various uh, events. So one such example, which takes a whole lot of planning, 
is an evacuation, a relocation, and a reunification of a school. So one of the goals next year will be to practice that evolution at one of the schools. It won't happen until the springtime, but that's an example of what will be on that training plan. So it's been a, been a lot of work. Um, his committee has just been excellent at reviewing this, providing feedback, um, doing that type of thing. So we wanted you all to hear where that is, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that as we begin the next school year. Um, the other piece that we've been very involved in is beginning the transition planning. And within the last two weeks, um, Dr. Dillon and I, along with various uh, other administrators, have met with the faculty at Maquan Elementary School and also as recently as yesterday at the Indian Head School for the purpose of talking about transitions, answering questions, seeing what we need to be doing in terms of the planning. We've also been working very closely with our WHEA representatives as well. Um, so I've asked Pat, with his background in strategic planning, uh, both through the military and in the private sector and now in schools, to be really the head in leading up that transition. So if he could give you, he's gonna give you just a, a brief summary of where we are this evening and where we see that going in the future. Yes, so, so uh, there's four things that really have happened so far. Again, we identified the leadership team that will oversee um, Indian Head and McQuan uh, next year uh, during normal, normal operations. Um, Kyle Riley will um, be responsible for um, the transition of the preschool and any of the special ed programs that move from McQuan. Uh, Bill Tranter will be responsible for the fifth grade moving into Hanson Middle. And then Beth Wilcox will oversee the transition of the remaining grades into the Indian Head School. Uh, again, we established uh, the leadership team that will do the day-to-day -day stuff uh, next year. So that was the first thing. Um, after receiving a whole set of a number of feedback, um, one of the great suggestions that came up, we we're going to establish a steering committee with about um, uh, eight to ten stakeholder representatives that will be providing guidance to myself and the other folks as we uh, do this transition because it really impacts three separate schools. Um, so that's uh, that's a committee. The names have been vetted and we have an idea of who we'd like to. We, we now need to reach out and, and finalize that. As uh, Dr. Whitner indicated, we had uh, question and answer sessions with the McQuan and the Indian Head staff, which I think those went well. And then this summer, uh, during the school break, uh, the kids aren't in session, we'll start to meet those uh, leaders that I mentioned who are responsible for the various portions of the transition. We'll meet and start to do the detailed planning process. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So I think we've made good progress. Um, I think people feel comfortable that if they do have questions to bring them forward. We've asked people to remain calm. This has happened many times before. We didn't get to this building by just uh, evaporating and jumping back in here and starting over. We had to move out of the old building. That people survived. We were able to do that. The whole school closed. We expanded Conley and Duval. We rechanged the configuration of Indian Head a number of years ago. So there is precedent, and as I said, we're working with the association as well. So we will be giving you regular reports at our meetings, but if things happen in between, uh, we'll certainly let you know. Also want to recognize that Kyle Riley is here with us this evening. Um, I think his goals are already set for the upcoming school year because he's walking into a lot of transition, uh, but we're excited to be working with him as well. Appreciate him being here. So that's where we are, and um, Pat, thank you uh, for your report. Mike. Are we thinking this summer to come up with, are we gonna have a construction cost price bathrooms? The Absolutely, we're gonna need up? to know that, Mike, because they're gonna be reworkings. We also need to also look at just the cost of moving number of different things we're gonna to need to be looking at. We are hoping that by the time school starts that we'll have a lot of, you know, as many things in place as you can at that point in time that will alleviate people's anxiety, but also will allow us to move forward and give us a sense of what, you know, just the cost and the amount of work are Thank you. involved. Are there any other questions? Okay, thanks. Um, I want to reiterate um, Chair Hayes' thanks to Ellen and John for the work that they've done. They're 
child-centered educators, and I've asked them to report this evening on what we're offering for our students this summer. And Ellen, you first, I guess. Um, you say as so? you know, if you drive up to Whitman Hanson Regional High School shortly after school is out for the school year, it looks like we're in session. Uh, this building is used, it creates a a lot of challenges to our cleaning in the summer, but I think folks can feel very comfortable that this resource is well used. So, Ellen, what do we got this summer? So I'm gonna report on the uh, general kind of summer camp activities that are listed. This is a two-page graph of the uh, programs that go on at Whitman Hanson with multiple weeks and dates and times, and kudos to Ernie for his group to try to work around the schedule. Um, but we do have some wonderful programs off-site. Uh, this year, again, we have a program for our students in Whitman at the Camp Con we call it Camp Conley. It's at the Conley School. They kind of took a break a year, but it's a terrific program where kids do some enrichment activities, some remedial activities, and it's a project-based program for our students in both uh, Duval and at Conley. We also have uh, middle schools. Uh, George runs the Fuel Up Play 60 program, which is Kevin knows it's very highly uh, regarded and the students from fourth grade up may join that program so we have some overlap there and at Hanson Middle we have a PE camp that runs youth cheer we have um, the YMCA is obviously there at the high school we have everything from uh, the high school athletics to the comprehensive medical teaching institute for uh, people to learn how to be EMTs. And that is held at the evening. So it's open at 7.30 in the morning, I think, and uh, the high school closes. Um, and then some of the other grant programs that are up here, um, Maureen Leonard, who I think you we've had here before, does a beautiful program in the summer, a summer enrichment program. And then we basically have my granddaughter's favorite, which is the science camp with John Rosen. And I'll bring her back this, this uh, July I think it's the 24th, her birthday's the 28th, and John always celebrates her birthday, so we're coming back. Okay. Um, and then the other programs, we do have North River has some rental, and I can pass it on to John because he takes that part of the, the program from me. Sure. Um, so in special education, we have a number of kids who attend academic programs over the summer, and these are parts of their IEP, so the, their, their special ed team at their buildings determines that, that the students, the severity of their needs are such that they need to come to school during the summer to make sure that they don't uh, move backwards uh, and they're in good shape to start the year in September. Um, so for this year, it's gonna look very much like it did last year. Uh, at McQuan, we're gonna have our preschool program. Uh, at the high school here, we have our kindergarten through fifth grade programs. Uh, and we also have high school uh, extended school year for the programs that run here. Uh, Hanson Middle has programs, including their two sub-separate programs, as well as a tutoring program. Uh, and at Whitman Middle School, we also have a, a tutoring program as well. Um, so uh, several of the buildings in the district uh, are used for ESY. Um, everything starts on July 10th. Uh, most programs run through August 3rd. Uh, we do have a handful of students who run through August 10th. Uh, and services range from everything up from maybe one to two hours of tutoring a week up to full 16 hour, four and five week programs um, for our most needy students. Um, right now we have 57 staff members, uh, that including teachers, paraprofessionals, various therapies, speech, OT, PT, nurse. So we have a wide range of folks working the, the summer. Um, and in total, as of today, 57 staff members. Um, so if there's any questions, I can certainly answer them. Yeah, John, are these programs, um, are these an extension of the services these kids are receiving, or are these optional programs that people are just availing themselves of? We offer it in, in IEP meetings. Mm -hmm. The team determines that this is a need of the student, so we offer it to the student and it's put on the IEP. Mm -hmm. um, most of our students do access it, but we do have students who choose not to access it, and that's parents' choice. All right. Thanks. Anyone else? Great. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And one of our programs that has just come online as well is we'll also offer tutoring services for our English language learners. We were very fortunate that a grant we have in conjunction with North River Collaborative had some money left over for tutoring, and our ESL teacher at the Whitman Middle School will be offering tutoring services, <coughs> and that flyer is just going out now. So very comprehensive programs. and. Uh, Lots of opportunities for our students. So thank you both for your report. Appreciate it. 
Um, next, we're going to talk about virtualization. If you recall, two years ago, in May of 2015, taxpayers in Whitman Hanson voted to support and fund virtualization in the Whitman Hanson Regional School District. This has been a very intensive project, uh, but it has moved forward, and I've asked Chad to give you an update on where we are today. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, give an update on this year has been uh, exciting and uh, a very uh, fruitful um, year on the virtualization front um, for uh, the deployment that we've been going through this year. Um, we've seen the full extent of the virtualization for the year, um, ending uh, the school year right now, where we uh, have virtualization fully deployed through all areas of the district, um, every school building. Uh, reaches every student and um, to the fullest extent where it not only um, uh, works with all the students and the staff each day but also after hours uh, with staff utilizing it on their own devices home devices things like that um, as well as the students started utilizing it um, even more um, towards the end of this year um, we sent a letter home to the parents notifying them encouraging them to have the students utilize the virtualization to have an extended arm of what we have here and what we offer to the students. So uh, a lot of students have been taking advantage of it. Uh, we've got a lot of good feedback from students. Um, we've uh, heard from a, a few students in middle schools, high schools that are utilizing it after school to get the software programs that they have here that they want to utilize or write a um, document or report up, um, access documents that they have here. And that virtualization gives them that ability to do that. Um, and it gives them an ability to do it no matter where they are, on, no matter what device they have. Um, so it gives them a great flexibility. And so from here, we're fully deployed with our virtualization, which, which puts us in a very good um, circumstance where we're very flexible in the district now. Where, um, where we've deployed it, we, we have the ability to not only use um, the virtualization in, on devices like iPads and computers, but now once our devices that we have, this, the um, these standalone devices, start to fail on us. We can replace them with very cheap devices that cost uh, $200. They're about this size right here. And there's really nothing to them. The life expectancy on those are uh, five plus years on them because they're literally a cell phone in a box that connects to a keyboard and mouse and a monitor. Mm -hmm. So we're in a very good area right now where our flexibility um, we're, we'll, we'll be in a hybrid environment where we have um, some standalone PCs, just a regular PC where we have a lot of software to utilize for digital photography, uh, video editing programs like that in high school. But then we have a lot of areas where we just need a PC to get on the internet. Uh, we would use a lot of the virtualization, um, like in the library here, most all these machines are virtualized because they utilize um, software and, and stuff on the internet. Um, and then that gives us now that the next phase to it where, you know, if we want something where it's fixed, we use the, the virtualization stations. Or if we want to go mobile, we go into more of the Chromebook area where we'll start seeing a lot of that expanding where we are now. We're at about 1,100 or 1,200 Chromebooks in the district. And where we see it going is, you know, taking a lot of the <clears throat> um, computer labs where a fixed computer lab like they've been since I've been in high school and probably longer than that, where it's just rows of computers, everyone looks forward. Now we'll probably go into more of a, a flexible area where there's no computers on tables. You take Chromebooks or mobile devices, maybe an iPad or something, and you have tables that move around. Very flexible area to do curriculum and different uh, configurations with the teachers. So um, this summer we'll start kind of working on some of those areas where we're giving the school some more flexibility um, in creating those environments to give the teachers and the students some um, some more areas and to kind of enrich some of the curriculum. Go ahead, Fred. Mm -hmm. Do you see us going to a uh, possible bring your own device if a student wished to? Um, with the students opening that up, you get into a little, um, it gets into a little difficult area where depending on what they're bringing in for a device. I think that the, the fashion that we're going now of getting the Chromebooks, I think we're making some really good progress on the model that we have now is buying Chromebooks for carts and putting those in the classroom. So every classroom will at some point get a cart full of Chromebooks, which they'll utilize when they're done, they put them back in and they move to the next class or 
uh, if they're moving classes. So I think that's the model that I think will work the best for us because what you have when people bring in devices, um, they're not all the same. Uh, there's different things on them. Um, them getting on our network, um, them not working, who's responsible for them. So there's a lot of different areas that are very tricky. Um, and then when people bring them in, you have the have and have nots of someone can bring it in because they have one, some people don't. So I think the model that we have now is going to work really well because um, we're well on our way with that 11, 1200 range of Chromebooks. Um, in addition to what we have here, which is the fixed devices and um, laptops and iPads. So um, I think that's probably the best model um, that the principals are looking forward to progressing in the years um, going forward. Anyone else? Um, question, Dan? whether it's Chad or Ruth. With these Chromebooks in Google, um, will we be implementing like across the board sometime, some point where all teachers will be use, utilizing the same type of, because my son, you know, one or two teachers may use certain things and other teachers don't at this time. We'll be, you know, putting that across the I, I don't see us being 100% the same thing because people have a variety of different needs and uses. Clearly Google has amazing opportunities and we've done a lot of training with Google, but I don't see us going all one way and not the other because things change so fast in technology. I mean, years ago we were totally PC. We were never going to go with Apple because Apple was having some tough times. Well, we had to sort of change our tune on that when we saw how Apple bounced back. So Dan, I, I think that you're going to see us doing a lot of Google things, um, depending on the curriculum area and what the needs are. Mm -hmm. So I don't really see that. Chad, maybe you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I think, I think you, you said it exactly. We, we try to give everyone flexibility um, and not push certain things on people because different people do things well with the Google stuff. Some people do things well with the Microsoft stuff. Um, or some stick to just web-based um, programs or software that's on the web that <clears throat> they use in, in the curriculum. So I think given the flexibility, I think works really well. Um, and when people see things working well, they'll start utilizing it. So I think you'll see the good stuff come out. And um, so I think given the flexibility, I think is, is really good. Right. And I think the challenge for us is making sure that we're providing opportunities for training and how to use these devices, how to use these software programs, all these things to improve teaching and learning and student outcomes. That's ultimately the goal. Um, we are working with the curriculum directors that on the opening day of school when teachers come on the 28th, after we do the morning program, we're going to have two hours of professional development that will be technology linked to content. And I'm just got another draft on that this afternoon. Haven't even had a chance to look at that with the directors. But that will offer things such as how to use Google in the classroom, but it also might have something, we belong to primary source for, um, we've talked about that for history social studies and um, things such as that'll be how do you use their electronic resources to improve teaching and learning. So um, I think our commitment is really to making sure the things we have are used to improve mm -hmm. teaching and learning. No, my concern was just basically like, Google's free. It is. Microsoft, you have to pay for it. Not everybody yeah. can afford yeah. to no. buy Microsoft products. Yeah. So it's really looking at a variety of things. Anyone else? Pat. I just want to compliment Chad. He also did a good bit of work with our foreign language curriculum director. And I just 30, spent 30 seconds on, on describing what you did there with the essentially a virtual mobile lab that you yeah, work with. Yeah, we, well, um, with Kristen uh, Thomas, um, we've we looked at a few different things. Um, they have a, com a computer lab up here for um, language lab for the language uh, in the high school and looked at a few different areas and with going the mobile, um, uh, so we looked at a few different things to take advantage of the mobile. So what we're going to do uh, is transition her room, her computer lab, the traditional computer lab into a mobile computer lab for her with uh, laptops um, in addition to the soft the language software which is mobile uh, and it's all web based in the cloud which will allow her students to not only do the work here in the classroom with the laptops but also utilize it at home as well so okay. um, we're looking forward to taking that initiative on uh, the summer and getting that ready for the students um, it's been a tr transition in the last few years of the old software going into the new but I think this will be good stuff in addition to that we we did a lot with uh, this year on Rosetta Stone, which is, I think, a, a really um, a really powerful tool for 
her to annex her ability to get languages in the hands of the students. She's been, she did a pilot of about 10 to 15 students um, with Rosetta Stone where the student has access to the Rosetta Stone program where they can pick a language or a level of a language that they might not have here in the school. So someone could take like uh, German or Russian or Chinese <coughs> in there and immerse themselves in it as an independent study or maybe in, um, uh, in addition to what she's been doing maybe in Spanish, there's another level of Spanish in the fourth or fifth level. She's been kind of working on that as a pilot and we're looking to potentially utilize that into the next level in the coming year or years. Um, and it's such a powerful program that you can literally push that down into the middle and elementary just to get kids a flavor of um, the language where it's, it's purely based on you looking at something with a mic on and a headset and you listening to what they say and seeing the picture and you talk and it tells you if you did it right and it corrects you and it's, it's a really neat program and uh, she's been getting a lot of good responses from it and feedback from students so I think um, this is something I think that's been a priority for the d district Absolutely. it's come up with the foreign language so I think it'll be a great um, yeah, addition a good solution yeah Fred uh, just uh, to clarify uh, when it comes to say Microsoft products sure. if a student is logged in on a virtual machine from their home they don't need to have Microsoft products because they're using the license that's already existing in the high school that's correct so right. they don't need it on their own machine they can have it, can uh, use it. Yeah, they have right access the virtual. to everything that we have here. They have access to there with, it's not just Microsoft, it's any other software products sure. or licenses. Yeah, but that's correct. Okay, they I just want to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, exactly uh, as if you logged in on a computer yeah. here. So, um, I'm a firm believer. Um, I've got the app on my iPad. I can access anything from anywhere. And when I work at home, I have double screens. And because of virtualization, I can do two screens. When we had remote access, you couldn't do that. So um, every weekend or whenever I'm working at home on something, I give thanks to the technology department and to Chad uh, for a very creative solution. I haven't heard a lot of other school districts doing this. Um, it was really a, for, a front runner. and. Um, I think two years down the road, we feel it was a very solid decision. So thank you. I know it's, it's been not always been smooth, but um, clearly we're in a good place. You have a great team. Yeah. Been yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? We good? Okay. Okay. Great. Um, as you know, uh, about a month ago, I presented you with my end of the year goals. You were then given a packet to do my evaluation. It needs to be done in open meeting, and here we are. So I'll turn it over to Bob. Okay, I want to thank all of you for getting all of them done. They all came in, and Michelle, as always, thank you for uh, tallying it up and making it easier for me as we moved along. Michelle was partners with me on this, and she did all the work. I did most <clears throat> of the watching. The uh, end of the cycle, summative evaluation. Step one was assesses progress towards goals in the four there was five categories, did not meet some progress, significant progress, met or exceeded. <clears throat> the first one was professional practice goal. We had one significant progress, three met and six exceeded. Student learning goal, we had five met, five exceeded. District improvement goal, we had six met, four exceeded. So all of that was all good, that was step one. Going to step two was assesses performance on standards. That was a little different. It said unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary. Standard one was instructional leadership. Three were proficient. Seven were exemplary. And for anybody that watches, it means it was 10 school committee members that did this evaluation. Standard two was management and operations. Six were proficient. Four were exemplary. Standard three, family and community engagement. Five were proficient, five were exemplary. The standard four was professional culture. Five were proficient, five were exemplary. The next was step three, overall summative performance. Again, it was unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient or exemplary. Five were proficient and five were exemplary. I had 10 people fill out forms and they all Everybody had some comments, so I took a couple random ones, and I'm going to read them unless you want me to read all 10 of them. I just took a couple, and I did pick them randomly. One of them said, 
During the year, it was evident that Dr. Whitner was driven to create the best possible student educational and social environment. Dr. Whitner has done a good job working with budget constraints. She strived to be enhanced, balanced communication when dealing with a complex, uh, sensitive, a complex of sensitive issues. Overall, she is highly proficient performer for this school year. And these were written by school committee members, so some of the handwriting I'm having a little trouble with, but it would be with mine too. Ruth continues to be an asset to the district. Most of her, uh, if not all of her goals were met. You continue to fight for what's best for our students, staff, and community. We as a committee and Ruth need to continue to fight for full day kindergarten. I am very grateful to have her in this district. Thank you and congratulations to Ruth. So as you can see, the committee seems to be very pleased with our superintendent. I want to thank all of you again for bringing this forward. If anyone has any questions about this, I have it. Michelle, I think we keep it in a file, mm -hmm. and uh, Michelle files it away. Does anyone have any questions? I have a comment. <coughs> a comment. Go ahead, Bob. Um, <clears throat> as we said, the, the role of the superintendent has really changed over the years, and it's a lot different than it was probably 10, 15 years ago. And um, <clears throat> I think it's important to note that uh, there's a lot that goes on at the superintendent level. Just dealing with budget alone has to probably be the most frustrating thing. Um, also, I think trying to add classes as a superintendent is probably very frustrating as well. Uh, but all in all, um, I think you've done a great job. And I understand your frustration because it's frustrating for me as a former educator to see us sort of stay in one place as opposed to trying to move, to move forward. Um, but I, uh, I compliment you on your hard work anyone else <clears throat> I'd just like to say that um, I know that we get beat up a lot with uh, financial issues and cuts and we're not doing enough but I've I've seen a lot of improvement in what's happening at the schools That's good to hear. I mean my I've seen the science program hit the elementary schools and my oldest did not have that program in the primary grades and my youngest do and the, you know, they come home with their science projects, they're talking about science that never happened before, and neither of their parents have science background at all. So this is all coming from the schools. The virtualization was a good example of, of improving the quality of instruction. I think that um, I, I do view the, the um, <coughs> our um, curriculum coordinator, what do we call them? Directors. The directors, the, 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 our, our band of specialists who go around. Um, I see that that the inroads they're making into the elementary level, I think, are going to be really positive. Um, and and so, academically, even though some class sizes are are, are big, mm -hmm. and and and, and um, certainly electives and languages are, are we're hurting there, and, and, and music and, and fine arts. But um, I the priority has always been the core academics in the district, you know, and. Um, I've seen improvement there. I think that that should be noted. Regardless of what's going on with cuts and money, mm -hmm. there has been, I think, at the very core of what education is, improvement in the district, very recent improvement. Uh, just to um, go a little bit step further, as far as the curriculum directors go, uh, when that first came up, I was a little uh, skeptical as to how that was going to work, um, particularly at the elementary level where you're teaching four or five subjects and you have four or five <coughs> directors to come down. But I was glad to see that the directors sort of took the approach of you take science, I'll deal with language, so grade five will focus on this, grade four will focus on, mm -hmm. on that. And um, I think that's good and I, I agree with everything <coughs> that Kevin had to say. The one thing I would like to add, however, is that it's nice to hear a secondary teacher say how difficult it was when they went down to the elementary school and to see how much work the elementary teachers do, um, how much prep time they put into their, into their uh, subject matter, and um, how that transition has seemed to really to, to work very well. So as a former elementary person, it's nice to see a, a director from the high school say, wow, I can't believe what goes on at the elementary level. So I, I think And it's it, still a work in progress. Right. It, it really is, but I think it has been uh, <coughs> 
a really good thing for Whitman Hanson, and I think uh, what has come of that is what you mentioned, just a tremendous respect from our people who were former department chairs, more or less secondary, for what happens at the elementary level, Absolutely. and also bringing that content in there. But um, um, in terms of class size, I think for most of our classes, as a result of measures that you took as a school committee just a year ago, our class sizes are, are quite good yeah. right now. Yeah. And that's another progress that I think we've made. There are some electives um, and also some specialist classes, particularly at Whitman Middle School, that are too big. But I think when it does come to core curriculums, particularly at the elementary, those class sizes are much better placed than they were several years ago. But um, largely, I, I do think doing our strategic plan has helped tremendously. Um, as recently as Monday evening, when we talked about finances with both towns, we're charged with letting folks know what it is we need, what our budget's going to look like. Um, we met to do look at our action plans yesterday with our consultant, Lori Likas, and we all felt it would be very, not that difficult to be able to say, this is exactly what Whitman Hansen needs and what it will take to move forward. So I think we're, that part of clarity has definitely improved over time. Um, none of these goals could be accomplished without the work of the people around this table and the people we work with every day um, in the classrooms, leadership team, administrative team, everybody. We think in Whitman Anson, we really do work together to make things happen. I think when we do become frustrated, and I'd recommend this to all, go to a classroom, talk to kids, talk to teachers, see what's going on. This year, had the pleasure of going through the schools with Chris Howard. We had a marvelous day together. I am willing and happy to do that with anyone because when you do that, all the work and all the frustration goes away. All you need to see is that child learning to read or just the crazy comments they make and it all makes sense. Um, but um, that's where we are, yeah. Good. I don't want to be the one to throw water in everyone's face and I agree that we have made strides but I do want to emphasize that there is still so much that we need and so much that we're lacking very true. Uh, yeah. things are yeah, better no, no, that's perhaps, fair Fred I think specifically I, in the context of the superintendent's performance yeah. is what we're talking about now I, I, I know we're not getting into I budget just, right now I don't want I someone have, that I may hope. be watching on TV yeah. saying they're doing a great job. Everything's all well and rosy. They're improving. And I'm not saying that we're not, but there's so much more that we could be and should be doing. And I just wanted to make sure I emphasize that. Okay. I probably work with the superintendent on a daily basis, and I speak with Ruth just about every day. In fact, I would say it's sometimes day. more than once, yeah. right? Yep. And having worked with mass association school committees and gone to many meetings, the average shelf life for a superintendent is between two and a half and three years. Right now, there are approximately in the state 60 intern superintendents in schools. Right around there, Ruth. Probably, it, it, yeah. it runs. I don't know what it is right the now. The superintendent's job has gotten much more difficult over the years. I've only really been here for two superintendents, one being Dr. McEwen and one being Ruth. And the the difference I've seen in education and how education has changed in the last 15 years is unbelievably different. <clears throat> and the ability to have her change on the fly, and that's basically what you're doing. The superintendent's job years ago, and I looked into it, was much different than running this. It's like running a big business. You have to change on the fly, and you have to have the ability to change. And there's so many different problems, even Bob, than when you were in school. Social and economical problems are a big, big part of this. So when you change it on the fly and she's been doing that and it's hard to do, I, I applaud what she does for that. And I think she does a good job. So congratulations and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. For what you do for Whitman Hanson Regional School District. Oh, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. Um, I was going to apologize to Maureen McKenzie for not taking her out of order. She's sitting here diligently, and I know she's got stuff to do, so why not, I'm going to take her out of order, yeah. even though I you're still in your report. I think that's a great report. idea. Come on up, Maureen. Mm -hmm. I, and apologize. I should have taken I'm looking and I'm going, why didn't I take her in the beginning like I did with Ernie and, and such? So I apologize. Oh, you should have spoke up. Yes. No, I was glad to hear it all. 
Hi, I'm here again to talk about school lunch prices because of the 2010 Healthy Hunger Act for Kids. I'm sure you've all heard of it. If you don't know what it is, it's when they told us from the government exactly what we had to put on a plate, what we needed to offer, how many times a day, and what it will cost. Also, how it will affect our budget. So we, they came up with a tool, which is what's in this packet, just a little picture of the tool, where you put in all your meal counts and it tells you what you should be charging at that given time for your school lunch, breakfast, and healthy snack items. <clears throat> in the beginning of the year of 2017-18, we should be charging $3 in order to be in compliance. That is a mandated price for lunch, $1.50 for breakfast, and we're supposed to go up between 25 cents to 50 cents on a snack. And the reason why they're doing that is to encourage the children to eat more meals. That's what that's about. And um, anything I can explain, any questions? Because it's just what it is, it's the, it's the law. But if there's any questions on how we got there, I'll be happy to answer them. What's the increase, Maury? The increase is going to be 25 cents across the board. So we're going from 275 to three dollars. Okay. It will affect. It'll affect a lot of families, and it may may change our numbers again on our free and reduced forms. I'm not sure, but um, we are up. We're up six percent across the board in every school. So they are eating. So um, uh, the program's working, and I'm not sure if a lot of you are aware of this. In breakfast. Not only do we have to get fresh fruit and vegetables at lunch, we have to offer fresh fruit and vegetables at breakfast. So the kids walk away with little cups of little cherry tomatoes because that's really the only vegetable they'll eat at breakfast. So when you're plating this for a lunch meal, it's with labor, it, the average lunch meal is $4.05 just to put on the plate. So this is why the government is now putting the prices up so that they are, so that you, um, they're not paying for every cent that's going on there. Maureen, I have a, this isn't a question specifically about the increase. I see it all over the internet at different times about schools having, my child didn't get a lunch, my child, that does not happen here, am I correct? Can you just touch on that? No, um, any child that comes in the lunch line, whether they have funding or not, other than at the high school, it's a little different, um, will be fed a lunch meal. Now, with the high school, um, if they already owe us <laughs> for four or five lunches and they're that old at the high school, we turn them away because they do know better. And they're doing something else with their lunch money. And there is a mechanism in effect of some sort to notify the parents or? Yeah, then the parent is then uh, notified with a letter, an email, and if it gets to a certain point, a phone call by me. So there's no gray area in this? No gray area. We will not turn a child away. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just want to commend Maureen. She had to go through, as you know, a food services review by the Department of Ed, not just one year, but two years in a row, has come out of those beautifully. The other thing that she's done as food services director is bring in many innovative programs. Uh, we now have breakfast in the classroom at Conley School and in some classrooms at the Duval School, also offer breakfast across the board. Um, at Whitman Middle School, she started Wings. You want to tell them about what you do with uh, that at both one? at both middle both schools. middle schools, but women middle schools now school have really what we off. call a wing and things bar, and they can basically pick what they want to have at that bar. They can walk up and mix uh, a mini meatloaf with a chicken wing and have their vegetables and their salads with it, and choose whatever they want to drink. At the high school, we now have a choose your own sa sandwich, which. They go into the bar, they pick their bread, they pick their cheese, they pick what they want on it, lettuce and tomato, and it's made fresh in front of them. We have something new, but I can't tell you. It's coming in uh, September. And a number of things are done to just encourage participation. They just yes. recently did Crazy Hat Day. Crazy Hat Day. Which was uh, just one of their many, many initiatives. But in addition to that, running a food services program is a huge challenge. Keeping it in the red is another huge challenge. Um, Maureen does that very, very successfully. She is not allowed to carry debt over from one year to the next. And when you asked if she follows up, yes. Um, and we have been, um, Whitman Hansen has just been 
I think, acclaimed for being able to keep that debt uh, lower than probably almost any other school system. But that's the diligence of uh, Maureen and her department in doing that. So it's it's my staff. Trust we, me, they're fabulous. It, well, you all work. You have a good staff, and you all work <laughs> you do. together. You are wonderful. Um, but I think we have an excellent program. We get monthly reports from her on how we're doing financially, and her little car is being fi is fixed now. We Maxie is great. We have a car. She's yeah, an electric hybrid, and she delivers food to the different schools. And her name is Maxie, and she's all well. She's but a little she was having um, trouble holding hybrid. a charge, but she's got she's better. It was indigestion of sorts. She had right? indigestion because she needed her own charger. Yeah, she didn't like going to public ones. And fortunately, that was purchased uh, partially paid for by a green grant, and then uh, the remainder paid by our taxpayers. So it's great. So I would entertain a motion to raise the lunch from 275 to three dollars which is a 25 cent increase so moved Second. or would you perhaps uh, prefer a motion to raise all uh, items by 25 cents that's, that's fine. what you're seeking yeah, that's, that's fine. fine is that your motion that's my motion second second, second. <laughs> discussion <laughs> all those in favor thank you Maureen. thank you Maureen. thank you very much and again, I apologize. I should have got you in the note. No, it was good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to superintendent's report. Christine's going to talk to us about um, where we are with the sixteen seventeen budget. <clears throat> okay, there's, um, we'll start with the revenue. That's the one pager. Uh, so the first column shows you what uh, we anticipate receiving in revenue. The second one is the transfers, which came later in July um, after we got the actual state budget. There were some changes there. Then the third column shows you the actual anticipated revenue after those changes. The year-to-date expended sh shows you what we've already brought in um, through the end of May. The last column shows you the available budget, which is what we still anticipate receiving um, in June. The first one is the Medicaid reimbursement. That's a monthly reimbursement so we anticipate a, a payment in June chapter 70 the same is just over two million dollars the charter school reimbursement um, you can see we anticipated um, receiving 78,728 and to date we received 112,000 so we've actually received more than was anticipated um, from the state budget at the end of the year last year uh, chapter 71 transportation reimbursement received that twice a year um, we've already received three hundred and thirty seven thousand six hundred and eighty two dollars and anticipate um, another three hundred thousand or so in June the end of June uh, homeless transportation reimbursement uh, we anticipated thirty thousand that seventeen thousand one hundred and forty uh, was based on the prior year, but we received it after June 30th, so I have to book it in the, this current year. So still, in, ho we're hope to, hopeful to anticipate um, some more homeless transportation reimbursement by the end of June 30. If not, it will run into next fiscal year. Um, the interest income, uh, we anticipated $10,000. To date, we've brought in just over $42,000, so we received over $32,000 more than we anticipated. Spoke with David Leary this morning, our treasurer. Um, and the investment income, you know, on average has been just over 1%. And in that particular account, the average daily ba balance is between five and a half and six and a half million, which this month in June will substantially go down because we have our balloon payment for our teachers uh, next Wednesday, June 21st. They receive five. Um, payments they have 26 payments for the year but they in the, they get their lump sum payment in June um, do you, does anyone have any questions oh and the other one I'm sorry the circuit breaker um, I've not we I've not made that transfer from our circuit breaker fu funds as of yet we do into we that is also another um, that it comes four times a year and we I, we anticipate another um, deposit at the end of June, June 30th, on or about June 30th. Keep in mind this report is for 6, 17, 18. 16, 17. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong line. Yep, 16, 17, correct. And when I report out in August, <coughs> when we 
when we come back in August, um, I'll have the closeout transfers as well as all of those reports updated. So much can happen in the next. Any questions? Any questions on the revenue piece? Uh, okay. Make an event though. Yep. What do we anticipate uh, still to receive? Um, I don't know what we anticipate to receive. Um, it hopefully at least the twelve thousand dollars, but we might not receive it by June thirty because there's still. I talked to Desi uh, two two or three days ago, mm -hmm. and they're still in the works determining how much <coughs> funds there are to actually re reimburse us. So we're so. going to overspend that by quite a bit. Yes, I, I'll mm -hmm. get to that when we get to the expenditures. Yes, a, as a matter of fact, if you pick up your um, the next several pages it, at the top says year to date expenditure report. You might as well move right to that. Um, if you look on page nine, almost to the very bottom, uh, the McKinney Vento, which that what the McKinney Vento asks <coughs> is that we have to transport our, um, mm -hmm. our homeless students if the, if they were currently enrolled here and they became homeless. It's our the school district's obligation to pay for them to transport depending on where they are living to the, the school that they resided in before they became homeless. Currently, um, if you look to the far right where the available budget is, we've already overspent the into, uh, what we had budgeted by $51,000. So going back to the revenue, um, when we do our end of the year report, we break out um, the homeless transportation, what the district has spent, and then we get reimbursed on that. It's, last year, I think it was about 30%. So and it's supposed to be reimbursed at 100%. That is correct. Yes. Subject to appropriation. Mm -hmm. Christine, how many students is that? For the I think it's about 000? just under 40 students. Do you know, John? 30-something 30, 30 like, was the last count, right? Yeah. I'm not, I, I didn't think it was that much. Okay. I think part of the problem is the distance at which they're coming from, mm -hmm. and the rates, the rates are changed by by the distance. Of course, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Well, I don't think it's the, the volume of kids, but yeah. I think distance is a, well, it's a right. But time. I mean, mm -hmm. and the other thing that's happened as right. well is that if students are in foster care, um, we're also responsible. And the way the legislation works is it's supposed to be a combination of DCF district, and we also use <coughs> Title One funding for it. But that's coming down the road as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, today, um, Ellen Pat and I were at uh, South Shore Superintendents, and Jeff Wolfson, who's the Deputy Commissioner, spoke about McKinney Vento as well as all other transportation. And it was very clear that just trans student transportation in general is a gigantic concern that needs to be addressed. Special education transportation, which is separate from McKinney Vento, is not reimbursed and it's expensive. We've talked a lot about mandated, non-mandated, not getting reimbursed for Chapter 71. That's part of it. You see the homeless piece, which, our, which uh, Suzanne Baum, the state auditor, said was an unfunded mandate, but it's still not funded. And we talked to him about that today, I think more or less just to make sure folks don't forget we need to talk about that. Um, the other issue is when it comes to just regular transportation, there aren't many vendors. So when you even go out to bid for a transportation company at the size we are, there are not many competitors. Um, it's a big issue, See, and McKinney Vento is, is a piece of that. The last two um, bids that we have for transportation, <coughs> we only had one bidder, and that was for a student. We well, might have had yeah. more than one vendor pull the, the bid specifications, but only one vendor ultimately. And I think what happens with homeless sometimes, if you have a single child who's homeless at a far distance, mm -hmm. A vendor is not going to take a single van for an hour, two hours for a single student. So we're getting a lot of vendors who turn us away for a job for a homeless student because they are so far away and it's a single student. We've had it cost close to $300 a day to transport one student. Christine, when you run $51,000 in the negative because you've, we've uh, budgeted $45,000, where's the 51 come from? Well, that's why we call it a budget, and there's some areas that we'll, we'll see some savings that we'll, at, at, in August when I bring you the transfers. Um, once we close out the year, I'll have a really much better understanding of where we're going to see some of the savings that will offset that. 
So if you went $300,000 over in your budget, what I'm getting at is that's what the E&D is, is Correct. for. Correct. You can use. You just spent fifty-one thousand more than we budgeted, and the budget is right to zero. So if you had no savings, you would be hitting E and D for fifty-one thousand dollars. Same as if we had an issue for three hundred thousand dollars, it would come out of E and D, and that's why the E and D is there. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And why we're on the subject of E and D, um, that I also will have an estimate for you in August, but we'll, it won't be certified until October. Um, typically, the, since I've been here the last few years, we've seen significant savings in health insurance, which I can tell you today we will not be seeing that significant mm -hmm. savings, which has typically been between two and three hundred thousand this year. Um, we're going to be within ten thousand dollars in that um, in the health insurance line for a couple reasons. The last few years, a lot of the kids were under 26; they were still under their parents. Some of them have since turned 26. We've had a lot of Babies born this year, and we've also had a lot of marriages this year. So um, uh, a lot of the plans that were single plans became family plans, right, Pat? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the um, staff here turned 26 this year, so they have to go out on their own uh, plan. Um, so it changes. It changes, right. And that with also having an increase of 15%, um, that also... Yeah. Is it plays a factor as well. The other thing that's going to play a factor in this year's um, turnbacks is we've had a lot of um, unanticipated retirements in the last uh, <coughs> few months or even few weeks that um, when they leave here, they get their sick leave buyout. So that is not taken into consideration here either. So th those are the main factors of why uh, you're not going to see the significant amount put back into ENT like we've seen in prior years. And that was after we waived the notice requirement, right? Is that? We only picked up one with that, didn't we? Oh. After we said the notice of July 1st, in terms of retirements, was there just we the got one? one? We got oh. one. Okay. But there were some others that um, were just some late, other ones. later ones. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Right. So they weren't anticipated. They weren't anticipated. But, and they, they have to tell us by a year so yeah. uh, people are telling us now for next year so we didn't know that when we were planning fy18 it just seems that this year there's been a lot more it since january even that we're responsible to um give them their sick leave buyback so any questions about the 16 17 budget thank you thank, thank, you, thank you christine you. ruth i think i'm all set Okay, old business, FY seventeen eighteen, Christine. Christine. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think I brought this to your attention uh, last school committee meeting, um, looking at the ways and means budget for the charter school um, sending tuition. This seems to be quite an increase from the governor's first budget, budget proposal to the mm -hmm. house proposal, um, close to two hundred thousand um, dollars. But they also, the charter school reimbursement um, seems to be up 50000 so it's really a net of $150,000. Uh, we are just going to have to wait and see to when the actual budget comes out, which probably will be sometime in July, so I'll report out to you in August if there's any um, change there. Um, any other significant changes in the 17-18? Um, those are really the only two that really jump out we're getting may we're maybe getting a little bit more in chapter 70 um and regional school transportation is going to be flat so mm -hmm. questions anyone thank you okay moving on to new business driver education fees in your packet the proposal to increase driver education fees the current program is $595. The proposed increase is to $645, which is a $50 increase. The road test appointment current program fee is $95. The proposed increase is to $125. The last time there was a fee increase was in 2009. If you look down further, it sort of puts us in line, keeps us cheaper than some of the other ones. 
got a local and a private. And it sort of uh, gets, gives our students a little bit of an edge. Silver Lake appears to be a little cheaper. And Duxbury High School driving in Duxbury is, will be $45 cheaper if the increase is voted. Is there any question? Uh, Cheryl Windham is the director of our driver ed program. Uh, she wanted to be here tonight to talk to you herself, but she was unable to make it. Um, th these cars um, <coughs> last between two and three years because they get <laughs> worn down and beat up. So um, the last time that we've bought cars, she's actually been able to buy them under $10,000 and be able to buy them directly out of uh, her revolving account, not have to go. Um, so that's one of the main reasons that she wants to uh, potentially have you increase, vote to increase this, is so she's, she knows that one of the cars she's going to be need, needing to replace probably over the summer, if not in the fall. So. And again, the last fee increase was in 2009. The increase would be $50 on the complete program and $30 on the road test appointment. And entertain a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Discussion? You have a question. How many students are involved in the uh, driver ed program? Uh, well, she just had an, add another um, program for the summer. I think she can take up to between 20 and 25 students, but the driving time is all over the place. That goes on current, all yeah, year. Involved. And then um, I would say probably 60 to 65% actually do the road test yeah. appointment through us. It says, this says here that it's based on 110 a year, so. Right. In the total program. Right. Roughly. So it's about 20 to 25 in each session. Okay. Yep. Uh, Fred? Do we accept students from other? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not just a Whitman Hanson program. No, there's other students that are accepted as well. Entertain totally self We have a motion self made and seconded. So. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Acceptance of gifts. Michelle, I'm, I've got one that you sent me. That one's still good. Yep, this is from uh, Patricia Poria Collins. There's a donation for pre preschool. A donation of $1,000 has been made to the preschool program by the Sandra E. Kelleher Memorial. The funds will be used to support the development of a preschool science center that will be available to all preschool teachers within the program. I am requesting the funds be accepted by the Whitman Hanson Regional School District for this purpose. So moved. Second. <coughs> Second. And seconded. Discussion? Second. All those in favor? Okay. Yeah. Well, I was more. reading it from my iPad. Okay. The next one is, dear school committee members, the Duval School PTO has generously donated 25 walkie-talkies at the cost of $4,800 to the school, wow. so we may distribute them through the building, resulting in increased security. Respectfully, I request from the Whitman Hanson Regional School District Committee to accept this gift. Julie McKillop, principal. So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Great. Don't have any uh, field trips. Uh, subcommittee reports. Uh, Facilities? Yeah, we met earlier this evening. I'll give a brief overview. We, you heard most of the discussion did center around the uh, field. Uh, Ernie is uh, going to be emailing uh, district staff a request for any work needed uh, in their rooms uh, over the summer. That's going out tomorrow with a link uh, so that it'll be very easy for them to uh, complete a work order. Uh, the, uh, the department completed uh, as of this time, a total of 1,272 work orders uh, with the new work order system. Uh, compared to last year's work orders at this time under the old system, they completed 835. 
so the new work order system is working. Uh, they are, uh, with our capital improvements, everything is still in its infancy from the towns being generous to us, uh, but we're waiting for return quotes and proposals uh, for uh, most of the projects. The uh, cleaning of the buildings uh, will go on as scheduled. Ernie and works with uh, SJ Services, and they will be cleaning, shampooing, doing windows, et cetera and shining things up for the uh, upcoming school year in September or end of August. Uh, pretty much the normal uh, maintenance, so to speak. And that's pretty much about it. Fred, just a quick mention uh, to the facility subcommittee and to the school committee for all of you that were here at graduation or saw this building looked fabulous. Not that it doesn't all the time, but it looked yeah. really, really good that particular night. We get a lot of uh, comments from people in town saying the building was in good shape. and They couldn't believe it's 12 years old. It's almost hard to believe myself. But How did the um, ticketing system work? The ticketing system worked out. Okay. Worked out. There was a few glitches as there is when you change anything, but it seemed to work out. And Better than people, anticipated. People seem, yeah, people yeah. seem to like it, so it's a good move. Okay, negotiation subcommittee. Um, I know they haven't met yet, but I can briefly tell you that Ruth was having a meeting with um, Pat and I met with uh, Beth and Kevin today, actually. Okay, and well, actually, you, go ahead. And uh, we talked about negotiations, and they're more than willing to do um, ground rules, get that up and running, and begin meeting at the end of August. And I happened to come into it before that meeting about right. a week ago and Kevin mm -hmm. and uh, Beth were there and I, I mentioned to them that we'd like to get started early if possible and they're going to work on trying to do that. Um, I believe the drop dead date is October 15th, 15th yeah. but yeah. we're going to try to get it done before that and get this underway. Yeah. Um, they wanted to know if the committee would be okay having us just go over the ground rules in a smaller group. Ground rules don't change much. Um, I know it's Bob, Fred, Dan, Mike, Chris, and myself. Are you guys all right if we just meet with them? As, as long as there's a representative, other than yourself, as long as there's another representative present, that's fine. Yeah, we can all meet, but I mean, I, it, I mean it's, I don't, it's a I don't, 10 or 15 minute yeah, thing. I don't mind the ground rules as long as there's someone else there that yeah it's fine. Right. and they met um, recently too and their um, organization was was comfortable with just representatives meeting for ground rules the ground rules are well. pretty basic so. ground rules yeah, they're take not going to have the whole minutes. team that wasn't my understanding that no. they That's trust fine. that that will get done well and it's not a problem okay all right policy subcommittee mr chair mm -hmm. i'm sorry for negotiations uh I would think that if our negotiation subcommittee could meet uh, before the first formal meeting so that we can all uh, sit down and we discuss. We were talking about doing a meeting in August. Okay. Somewhere in, in between the next school committee meetings in August. So we, I was maybe. talking about getting everyone together maybe the week just to make sure then. we could go over it. Maybe the beginning of it, we'll, we'll notify you okay. of when and see if it's amicable to everybody. Right. And we can quickly go over the ground rules then. You know, I don't anticipate it being more than a 15 to 20 minute, half an hour meeting. Yeah, no, just, uh, you know, uh, what are the ground rules and also, you know, perhaps we can set uh, goals and objectives. Okay. Great. I have no issue with that. Everybody okay with it? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Boyce isn't here, so there'll be no pilgrim. Legislative representatives, Mike? Yeah, nothing. Um, today, the fair share amendment passed today, and we'll be voting on the ballot in November, which is interesting. Uh, other than that, nothing major. Any questions for Mike? Yeah. And I believe that's it for subcommittees. Did I miss anybody? No. Okay. Um, just before we adjourn, this is an interesting tidbit. If I can get it back, you might.
today a report come out ranking the 100 best places to buy a home in Massachusetts. Whitman ranked number five. Hanson ranked number eight. There you go. Yeah. Number one was Jefferson City in Worcester. The, the demographics of that report are, they don't take schools into consideration. No. Uh, it's... Yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> pretty much. It's but it was it was interesting. <laughs> Home income to ratio value, five year population forecast and a five year forecast score. So but it was interesting. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you all. Eight twenty four. Have a great summer. <clears throat>